uh, in an English translation of the French romance, William and the Werewolf. Uh, and I hear it from so many people complaining about linguistic things, and if I say, oh, well, actually, it's old, that usually shuts them up. Um, uh, secondly, singular they was fine until a bunch of 18th century grammarians decided it wasn't, and they also decided a load of other bullshit, like splitting infinitives as bad, adding a fake B in debt, they did that, and they added a fake L to salmon because they thought English should behave like Latin. It's not, like, it's not Latin! And are you just gonna let a load of dead grammarians boss you around? Tell you what to do without letting those grumpy old fucks push you around? Um, <laughs> Uh, third reason, there are so many languages that don't have gendered uh, pronouns at all, some of them probably speak one of them, like Tagalog, Maori, um, Turkish, and uh, that means millions and millions and millions of people are surviving, <laughs> not using gendered pronouns. Uh, four, don't like singular they, you're probably already using it, it's a very common construction. Uh, if someone says to you, I'm going to stay with my cousin, you go, oh, where do they live? already use a plural pronoun as a singular and it is you. Uh, you used to be the second person pronoun and the singular was thou and uh, uh, what happened was uh, the you was also the polite version to you so even if you're talking to one person if you called them you that was a very honourable thing to do. What happened was English was so polite that the singular form died out completely um, and it didn't go without a fight, there was even a book in 1660 by George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, saying anyone who uses singular you is stupid, <laughs> uh, but it went, and, and ah, fuck it, you're right, I do use singular you, I don't know, who am I, my prejudices are smashed by etymology, <laughs> and my life's really been changed by the last 45 seconds. Uh, so those are my arguments. I mean, anyone got anything to refute them? One of course. And then we have to uh, shortly wrap up. So I'm just going to skip through a few slides and you can just imagine what they would have been about. <laughs> okay, some, of, uh, some of the 150-ish gender-neutral pronouns being suggested for English. Can't talk about them, though, because the night is old. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'll just just fly to the end because Punch Up The Jam is ready to punch up a jam. But I will just say that um, our individual language use has a lot of power. And um, I don't think I can radically change the structure of society alone because I'm a whip and I wouldn't know how to set up a union like, <laughs> like Emma can Emma, but I'd love to, you know, be as, you know, as driven as that. Uh, but through language, at least, I can reflect a version of the society I want. So if it doesn't make sense to me, like gendered jobs, um, I don't have to go with it. I can just stop, use, I can stop using those words. And it's a common theme for the illusionist that it, it's very validating to have a word for something. So like, if, for it, say, an emotion or a medical condition, having the word can coalesce an idea and give it permission to exist and acknowledge it. And so I think... Could making a gendered language ungendered and less specific undo a concept? Worth a pun? Um, I mean, you know how powerful language is, because when someone misgenders you, or calls you a douchebag, or leaves the Z's out of your surname, it's very helpful. So, conversely, it has to be powerful to be empathetic and kind and positive and productive with language. And I know I said that language changes as society changes, but I do think it can happen a bit the other way around, too. So 